from here in uh, Las Vegas, going to be talking uh, with me about his experience working in the Vegas hospitality industry and some very exciting initiatives that he has for bringing more dignity here. So please, uh, Daniel, can you uh, briefly introduce yourself to us? How you doing, everybody? Um, thank you for having me on today. My name is Chef Daniel Stramp. Uh, I was born and raised here in Las Vegas, Nevada and actually started my culinary career here in this city. And after starting my culinary career here in this city and finding out how toxic it basically was, uh, I left and moved to Seattle. So in the matter of being in Seattle for five or six years, I flourished. I worked for chefs that wanted to teach cooks to become chefs and groom them to grow on to running their own restaurants and kitchens and following their own aspirations and goals instead of staying underneath one chef for their life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was able to work my way up to an executive sous chef of a $20 million a year steakhouse and then leave there to become a production, a production chef for a $60 million food production company to only return, leave and open a commissary kitchen for a James Beard award winning chef uh, for his 12 restaurants. So I actually have 23 designed software through Google documents that linked all 12 of my restaurants to my commissary kitchen, as well as to accounting through one, um, one form basically. And then, you know, after that, um, I was really just trying to find a restaurant that I could hone in my skills. You know, I had learned business, I had learned all these things and now I just wanted to find a home. So I was offered a position, um, uh, back here in Las Vegas at Spago inside the forum shops only to come back. And after being there for three months, find out that we're closing at the end of the year. Uh, so again, hopes and dreams kind of get smashed down. Uh, quality of food, you know, stays the same. There becomes no creativity. Uh, basically everything the restaurant was built upon disappeared because they were going to shut down. Um, so I left there and ended up working for a local chef in town named Brian Howard, uh, at his restaurant Sparrow and Wolf in Chinatown, which is the exact restaurant that I had been looking for basically my whole career. Um, and I thought the chef that I had wanted to work with as well. But the problem is, is as a young culinarian, uh, searching and chasing my own um, dreams and goals, you hit roadblocks with people who uh, have different beliefs on how things should be, basically. Um, so my interpretation of the Las Vegas industry is that if you are not a line cook for 10 years, then you do not get a chance to become a sous chef. And then from there, you know, five years again as a sous chef before maybe you'll get an exec sous chef or an executive chef title. Mm -hmm. which is complete nonsense because all you're doing is running a business. Um, food, it's a business mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So mm -hmm. kids go to culinary school to learn passion for food and creativity and the art behind it. And then obviously have to go into a business mindset. And a lot of that gets taken out. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't feel that the Las Vegas community really cultivates young culinarians. You know, a lot of these chefs that have opened their own restaurants off strip spent 10 years, you know, 15 years working underneath someone on the strip again. Mm -hmm. uh, so the strip culture is kind of, the strip culture is kind of the start of the problem. Um, obviously they're running big machines and beasts. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, this was about food and, and, and arts and, you know, finding a passion for something. So um, it seemed that what you just described is kind of a gap between education and then the reality of the industry. So um, you don't feel that culinary schools uh, prepare students for, for that, that business model that they're going into? Definitely. Um, you know, going to culinary school, they teach you so much and then you kind of have to read between the lines, which is why when a lot of people come out of culinary school, they're not, you know, maybe as well-rounded or as educated, but it's also what you put into it. Mm -hmm. But for a while, they kind of sold you this dream of, you know, go to culinary school and then when you walk out, you'll become a chef. Yeah. Uh, which isn't necessarily true either. So there is no culinary schools. They're not really representing like what the industry is actually about. You know, the long hours, the grueling hours you'll have to go through or, you know, personalities or mindsets or whatever the case may be. Um, so I think they definitely could try to educate on that a little bit more. Yeah. You know what's interesting? I have um, 
I have a week and a half of culinary school experience. So I'm actually a food scientist. So I like I went to a four year degree studying food, but in a more industrial commercial uh, capacity. So microbiology, physics, like big equipments, pasteurizers or whatever. Uh, but when I finished that program, I wanted to go to culinary school. Uh, and I was living in Hawaii and KCC, which is a community college there, has a very good culinary school. And I decided I would just go part time because I was working full time as a food scientist and I wanted to go part time. And uh, I was in the program for a week and a half because the first class I had to take was like a front of house internship class. And okay. they were demanding that I work for free. For like 30 hours a week in their in their like pilot kitchen that you know their students work out of and they they host dinners um and then they have like this front of house class so i was like this is insane this school wants me to work for free for them for this many hours and i'm only gonna get you know some passive like associates degree so my experience with culinary school was that yeah right off the bat i learned how abusive um and kind of yeah, I, I felt like they didn't they didn't even hear me when I said I had a full time job and you know like I, I have certain hours cut out to take the the class that I registered for, um, but I think that that that's a lot in the industry. A lot is expected of you, and not a whole lot of value is 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 given in return. And um, everybody hurts in the system, not just the employees themselves, but also the operators and the owners. Right for them to have you know, uh, low turnaround on staff, which I turnover is a big problem in kitchens, kitchen teams. Um, so it's not beneficial for, for anybody to uh, create this oppressive and, and marginalized system. So um, what's your solution? What's, what, what's going on, Daniel? What, like, what, what, are, you, what are you working on now um, in this problem? Um, so I'm forming a nonprofit just to start spreading awareness. You know, there's a lot of people who have reached out to me from around the country. Uh, and there's even really big name chefs that are trying to do the same thing, uh, like Sean Brock. You know, so Sean Brock again, um, had, uh, you know, an alcohol problem and, and it affected his, uh, mentorship and leadership in his kitchens. And then his boss is going sober, you know, he kind of, uh, found new ideologies and that has translated into his restaurants, which in return has made his food that much more beautiful. His staff is happy uh, and people want to go work for him again, just because he kind of faced his own demons. Mm -hmm. So to just, um, to get my nonprofit going and to start, you know, here in Las Vegas, because, you know, there's people in Arizona, um, Sean Brock's in the South. Uh, I'm sure that there's other people in, you know, different cities and states but for being uh, born and raised here in Las Vegas and almost forced out of my city by these chefs uh, that I wanted to become one day to only in return come back here and uh, want to kind of change the, the mindset. Um, you know, who knows? Potentially I could open a culinary school out here uh, and just kind of educate the right way and then build a restaurant next to it to where the students can work in it. Um, there is a project in town right now that the uh, UNLV's corner program will be a part of. Um, so students will actually be able to work there. So I am supposed to be um, kind of in charge of that program, hopefully as soon as it, as soon as it opens up. So that'll kind of all connect back. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my whole career has kind of just been education. So I'm troubled youth. Um, I didn't really have that, you know, figure that kind of guided me along the right route that you should take. Mm -hmm. So I found those figures in kitchens. Yeah. You know, that's where the guys who uh, taught me to be a better man or taught me basically everything. I mean, the kitchen raised me from 17 years old until now 28. I was raised in kitchens, but I don't see myself like a lot of these other guys. And I just want to the, the industry is either going to die because brick and mortars are already a thing of the past. And, you know, it's harder and harder for a young culinarian to go and open up his own business like a food truck or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So I do have a couple um ideas of ways to kind of give younger culinarians a way to start um, making a voice through their food. But obviously things are just going to take some time. Yeah, they will. They're, they're going to take time. But, you know, setting the intention and, and taking the steps forward and creating the movements, you know, are all things that you can do immediately right now. And, you know, I hope, you know, what we're doing currently right now in this moment can, can be a part of that. Uh, I think it's a 
It's a great initiative. I've been to the UNLV facilities. They're they're gorgeous. So I'd imagine, you know, that's a good place to start. Um, how is it, you know, with with uh, with evolution in in those programs, um, and then kind of like the powers that be, like are are those powers that are wanting to change and wanting to evolve, or you know, corporate sponsors or whatever they may be. Um, is that something that you feel will be uh, something that will get behind what you're doing or will be uh, another challenge? Um, you know, there's even large companies like, you know, like or large chefs like Wolfgang Puck, who's spoken out about, you know, kind of what he went through uh, early on in his career. Mm -hmm. So potentially to go to these larger um, restaurant groups and then just kind of have them kind of re uh, rethink their system from, you know, training curriculums to, you know, how you should talk to people and things like that. I mean, luckily in Las Vegas, we have the, the culinary union, you know, and obviously they help um, support a lot of employees, but then once you go off strip, you kind of lose that. So again, just to have an organization that if, you know, say someone, um, something happened to them and they don't know what to do about it, they can contact us and then utilize all of our resources to, um, kind of help them out through uh, any situation that may uh, I see. occur. The, uh, the last time that I did one of these podcasts, I talked about unions. That's all I talked about, kind of the history of unions and the trend of unions getting involved in hospitality. Um, yeah, the, the representation of unions for hospitality employees is so much lower than any other trade. So it is a really new phenomenon, but I was curious specifically about your experience with unions, uh, you had mentioned it. Are those unions doing any advocacy work outside of the obvious wages or discrimination? Are they like doing culture work? Are they working with operators on um, developing, you know, feminist culture or, you know, anti-racist culture within uh, the kitchen? You know, I'm not 100% sure as I haven't, uh been in the union in quite some time. So I don't necessarily know what they're doing out here to kind of help that. Yeah. I know some companies are still doing the, they're kind of going back to the whole sexual harassment and training courses and things of that sort. Um, but definitely not uh, much deeper than that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, it's a big area that needs a lot of work, especially here in Vegas. Um, you know, I'm not even in the industry directly as, you know, a member of service. I'm a vendor. Uh, and even I experience, um, you know, these issues and I can only imagine what subtleties, like vast subtleties must exist in the industry for an up and coming female chef or an up and coming, you know, black chef that has to deal with those underlying cultural, um, especially women. I think, I think, uh, sexism is a, is a very big issue. Um, well, I have yeah. Yeah. Uh and we went to culinary school at the exact same time through the same classes and graduated together. Mm -hmm. She was actually in the industry before I was, but she's obviously a girl. She's black and she's gay. Mm -hmm. So because of the flock that she gets, she has to put an attitude on because she has to defend herself basically because of, yeah. you know, kind of thrown at her. Mm -hmm. So that kind of halted her whole culinary career and left it to where she never got a promotion. She never got a chance. She was never, allowed to do more than what, you know, she was told to do basically. Yeah. And now she's a private chef for the Raiders. Oh, so she has, Good story. she has talent, uh, <laughs> you know, like in, in what she does, she's a culinarian. So her, her food is, is beautiful. You know, she cares about it. She tastes it. She eats it. She loves it. Uh, and she talks about it all the time, which most of these chefs don't even do anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, they get up to that corporate level and they haven't even cooked the dish in I don't know how long. So how do you really know what's, what our industry is doing? What do you, what trends are you setting or how are you even changing or revolutionizing our industry? All you're doing is just keeping the wheels moving on the bus that you started. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That personal passion. I mean, and that exists everywhere. It's not just in the hospitality industry. I think a lot of industries, the young people, especially that are new in their careers are realizing, shoot, like, I got into this because I was passionate about it and I, I already feel myself jaded and getting more jaded every day where I'm no longer passionate about it. And, um, you know, that may be a blessing in this pandemic and uh, this impending doom of the restaurant industry is that it's going to give those folks 
time to to uh, rediscover their passion. Now, you know, is this, if the system is going to be supportive of their passion is, is the work that we can be doing now. And that's what I'm most passionate about is that we have a good foundation for those folks to do the work in their passion and in the best way possible. So, um, you know, you mentioned something about young chefs having opportunities. Uh, you know, one of the silver linings on what's going on right now is that these chef, these restaurants are going out of business. A lot of them are brand new. I mean, there are restaurants in San Francisco just opened six months ago, right before pandemic, spent $2 million just on the kitchen, closed already, and turnkey ready to go. And these landlords are going to be very excited to get people in. And so um, uh, I had Chef uh, Jean Alberti on uh, talking, and he sees that this is gonna, actually going to be a really great opportunity for these young chefs because... Uh, the startup investment of a restaurant is just overnight going to go from two million to two hundred thousand, which is a you know great difference for for someone to be able to bring that together. Uh, do, what what are your ideas around this? Um, you know, I still think that brick and mortars are a thing of the past. So, building out these enormous outlets to one chef inside of it is just. People are going out to eat anymore, the limitations. I mean, the private chef world has increased so much over the last six months, it's not even funny. Um, so I think the the business model almost needs to change. Um, and I have an idea for that. I don't want to touch on it too much. Um, but basically it would give um, anyone an opportunity to basically create and run their own whether they wanted to be hands-on and or develop the team behind it uh, at a very low startup cost. That's wonderful. Uh, speaking of the private chef industry, so you say that there's a rise in that. How, how is the dignity on that? How uh, is, is, are there large like licensing requirements? Uh, how is the marketing on that and, and um, the value it returned for chefs that are going down that path? Yeah, I think there, there's there's kind of different levels or avenues, so to speak, um, because you could be a private chef for just like one person and kind of, you know, they have a business, they can kind of just hire you through the business, so to speak, or private contract or whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. um, you can get business licensing, um, you know, to be an actual private chef and then, you know, get a, a kitchen or a commissary to kind of work out of, mm -hmm. which again is a, a more or less expensive route to take to kind of become your own boss or, or business owner uh, in the industry. Cause that's what it is, is it's a business around food. So if you love food, then you'd be like, okay, how can I make money out of this? Um, but obviously you want to do it the right way. Mm -hmm. So I think being a private chef, um, there's a lot more dignity because you can kind of pick and choose your clientele. So, you know, when you build a good relationship with someone and then they're like, Hey, would you come cook for me? Then that relationship just kind of keeps going. Mm -hmm. You never really have a hard situation. And they're like, well, Hey, do you want to come and do this for me? It usually kind of stops at the beginning. Um, unless you really mess something up in their house or something. Like <laughs> yeah. I was always curious about that. Like what kind of like food safety licenses are required for doing private events? Um, I mean, private events, I guess, are different, you know, because then you can get like event licensing and stuff. But yeah. even in Seattle, I was a private chef for an estate. So basically the estate just uh, 1099 me as a private contractor. Yep. And that was all that I basically needed. Cool. Uh, Great. Up there. All right. Well, that's the path then. If, if uh, you're looking for looking for work, look into private chef. And I think that's a, it's a good opportunity. I just wanted to mention that Jeff Larson's watching and he uh, he greets us. So if you want to say hi to Jeff. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> uh, and he mentioned food halls with a lot of enthusiasm. What, what, what's your thought on food halls? Uh, I mean, food halls are going to be the start of the change of uh, the industry. Um, it's going to be like Portland, you know, with the food stalls to where someone can go in who's passionate and loves what they do and can build a team and do it themselves mm -hmm. um, for a very low startup. So the food hall definitely is going to be um, very similar. Also with COVID and the whole indoor dining and, you know, things like that. I think it'll kind of help that end as well. Yep. Uh, so I'd say that's the, that's the halfway mark between where the industry is going and where it's going to end up in my belief. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's great. Someone had made that point earlier about how this whole requirement mandate for outdoor dining is really going to help a lot in normalizing what I, the, no other word I can think better than street food. The, that term means so much for me, but uh, normalizing the concept that you can get clean, safe food outdoors. Um, yeah. You know, I think that that's been, that's been a big limitation of, of street food gaining traction in the United States. Because uh, you go anywhere else in the world and there's a very vibrant and sustainable uh, street food industry, pretty much. Um, but but here in the states, there's this big stigma that like, oh, I can't I can't order something outdoors. Like it, there's flies, it's dirty. It's like yeah, but this is this is the dude that cooks the same exact thing every single day for the same people. He don't want to get anybody sick. Like he knows what he's doing. So anyway. <laughs> Um, with a ghost kitchen. Yeah. So Jeff said ghost kitchen. So, um, yeah, that makes sense. I always thought about that too, like about chefs coming together, maybe one day a week, you know, there's seven chefs and each one features one day a week and they just put all of their effort into that one day, um, creating really unique, vibrant experiences. Cause that's where I think it's going to go. Like, I think the future of the industry is going to become polarized and, and like, a sit down dining experience is going to be a experience. You know, it's going to try to do with, you know, uh, what are they bringing in a uh, Dahlia lounge or something like that. And then the restaurants that they put in there is, you know, in the 21st century, it's so expensive to go out to eat anyways, that if it's not a multitude of things like dinner and a show mm -hmm. for the same price, then you're going to lose that form of dining yeah. because they just want to eat. They just want to eat food fast. That's good. So in Seattle, fast casual picked up, you know, six, seven years ago. Um, I have a friend who opened a restaurant out there and, you know, he's already had, he has four of the same concepts now just because of, you know, it's, it's true to what it is. Um, but in Las Vegas, slowly popping up, I'd say more in the vegan side of things, not much as the restaurants go. Um, but I think that there's going to start being a lot more fast casual places popping up for, just kind of certain types of cuisine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know about that. Like, I, I, I think it's going to be so polarized where it's going to be, it's going to be really elevated experience, like three hundred dollars a person type of experience, and then the other would be the opposite, like really fast, really casual, and really affordable. Because you know we are going into a pretty deep depression financially, um, so. I don't know. We'll see where it goes, but uh, I think for like a, a a high level chef, it's it's opportunity for them as well uh, to start playing with higher quality ingredients and and uh, changing the whole model, the whole experience. I went to uh, the May the Mayfair Club. I, I went there recently. That's like been the only like COVID dinner I went to, and it's so weird. It freaked me out because the day after I went one of their employees tested positive and they closed down and I'm like, geez, the one time I try to go out, but, um, that was a unique experience. Uh, and, uh, I feel like that could be a model of, of what will be fun. You know, that, that dining out would be like a four hour experience and you're going to, you're going to spend some money and you're going to value it a lot. For sure. So Jeff says it's hard to get the better ingredients. Yeah, it is hard. But at the same time, it's going to become easier. So this is this is my insight. And I don't know, Daniel, if this is something that you've thought about as a chef uh, or challenges that you've faced so far since the pandemic has started. Um, but India's border uh, with getting goods out has been closed since the pandemic started. So since March, no container ships of shit have left India, which means no turmeric has come, no cinnamon has come, no... Black peppercorns have come. None of those things have come. And so the wholesale suppliers, which is like what I do, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm deep in that. They're already starting to reach out to their big clients and saying, hey, we're, we're expecting to run out of these things very soon. Um, and uh, you can get them. The things are still being harvested there. It's just the container ships aren't leaving. Those ports have closed. But air freight is moving at like three times more the cost per kilo than average than usual. So um, I feel like the only products that are going to consistently stay coming into the country and being available for chefs are going to be the very high
quality ingredients that can absorb those higher shipping costs. Um, because like when you're talking about commodities, you're talking about something that's like here landed selling, you know, at the distribution to chefs at like some products are like as cheap as like $5 a kilo. And so the shipping, like air shipping from India right now, uh, even if it's a large air shipment FedEx being sent over is like $20 a kilo. You know, it's just not going to work, you know, like that, that doesn't work. So I think, I think that there's going to be some major pain in, in our ingredients, especially like uh, international spices and such. Uh, that's uh, it's really going to challenge the chefs to become creative and, and hopefully like in, in my hope, and I'm sure in Jeff's hope as well, uh, going to uh, motivate chefs and, and, and business operators to value higher quality ingredients and find ways to integrate them into their businesses. For sure. Yeah. So, yeah, just a little insight about what's going on in the... Is there any countries that that's happening in or just India? It's mostly India. Yeah, India is having actually a much worse response to, to the virus than we are, actually. I don't know if you keep up with numbers of all the countries, but India is really, they're struggling a lot. So um, their government has just taken the stance of shutdown. Like, they've been in shutdown, absolute shutdown since, since March. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So India is kind of a mess right now. Um, the cities, at least. The countryside is pretty cool, you know? Like, I get the farmers, they hit me up, and they're like, hey, Lise, how's the market going? And I'm like, yeah, the market's not going. I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Like, I, there, there's just not movement right now. We need to be patient. And they're like, okay, well, we have our tea. We'd like to get money. Can you help us with the market? And I'm like, you know, your customers on this side are, like, unemployed, have high rents to pay, have high cost of living to pay, and have no soil and seeds and water to, you know, make their own food. Uh, I think you guys are actually in a better situation because you guys at least have soil and seeds and can just, just, just you know, wait this out, um, which is, is really interesting, you know, that we're in this dilemma because... We think that we're so advanced and so, you know, developed here. But then when something like this happens, uh, our whole food system is, is really being threatened right now. So, uh, yeah, our friend Joe in South Dakota says cook with local food. You know, that's, yeah. that's a little hard here in Vegas, but. <laughs> well, we always had, uh, um, what was it, Urban Seed? Yeah. They were the lettuces and stuff. And then I think we have, what, Desert Bloom out here? At least, and so yeah, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, Urban Seed is done. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, a long time, two, three years done or something. Two years. It's, it's unfortunate, yeah, because it was a it was a great concept. I, I was good friends with them. Actually, we were trying to uh, to arrange some tea plants to be in like kind of little pilot area of their greenhouses, uh, so that we could like harvest a, a batch of tea from their few plants and make Vegas grown tea, which is ridiculous because tea needs like a subtropical climate. It would never, ever, ever grow here, ever. Um, but they, they just wanted to do that as like a little demo thing. I, it's it's great ideas. Um, I'm good friends with Carrie Clasby as well, who's always bringing food in from, from the West Coast, from California coast, which is which is good. But it's uh, it's hard here for us to, to cook with local, but it's always the best. It is the best, but sometimes we can't. Um, Okay, so I want to talk about something else with you that um, that I talked about in great depth in another one of these episodes uh, in regards to cancel culture um, and this fear of cancel culture, um, which is causing people to be afraid of calling something out or holding their peer accountable or holding their culture accountable. Um, and uh, the reason why this came up was because, and I don't know if you've seen this yet, but there is an organization that actually started first in Eugene, but they're very active in Portland. They're also very active in Chicago and Washington, and they just launched one here in Vegas called the 86 List. It's mostly on Instagram. 86 E D L I S T. Yeah, uh, they're on Instagram. They have a Vegas branch, but it's not active just yet. Uh, so if you go to the the port the Portland one is the most active. There's just like endless stories there. But basically, it's a platform. It's an Instagram account, and you just direct message the account uh, your story of of dealing with toxicity in the hospitality industry, and they publish those stories anonymously. 
and they list the chef, they list the restaurant owner. And there are at this point hundreds of stories and hundreds or thousands of engagements with those stories and people speaking up and saying, yeah, this is true. I worked there for two years and this happened to me too. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I saw that and I thought it was great. You know, I don't think that that list has specifically been called out for cancel culture, but just cancel culture in general has been, you know, really on the cutting board of like, is it really worth it? I, I'm actually personally involved in, in some cancel culture activity uh, right now. And I had somebody and I'm doing very selective uh, connection with certain people about this information. I'm not blasting it, but very specific conversations. And one of the people re replied to me that calling someone out can be just as bad as the actual, you know, bad deed that happened or, you know, and I was like, wow, that's incredible. Like we are still in this state of victim shaming that, uh, that those kind of conversations are, are still being had. Um, yeah, so what's what's your opinion on cancel culture or of of the role of holding the industry accountable for its actions? I think it's just don't be a dick. <laughs> I mean that's literally all it comes down to is don't be a dick. You know what I mean? Like everyone has feelings. The way the way that I see it is that the person who gets on their big high horse got there for a reason because they felt some type of way about something else from someone else. So then they just like make it a mission to make people feel how they feel so they feel better. It's that whole, if you just treat others the way you wanted to be treated, then we'd be fine, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think calling people out, you know, there's obviously a way about it and a way not about it. Um, sometimes I might even have to learn that, that approach too. But the thing is, is that, you know, if I'm a millennial and people want to look at me as, you know, that I'm young or this or that, and then I'm going to call them out because my mind is my mind. And if there's other people that also see the same thing or understand what I'm saying, then obviously it's, you know, a, an area to talk about. And so that's kind of what it's becoming is, well, I'm older and you need to respect me. But when you can't respect someone who's older, if they lost respect, you know, you have to give to get. So if I give everyone the same amount of respect and then in return, you're only given so much. Well, then now I know that I'm not going to give you as much respect next time. Um, so I, I think it's okay to call people out. You know, I mean, we created websites like Yelp to call people out that all it does is affect chefs like me. You know, I, I would stay up on Yelp all night long. And what, what do you mean that it was like this, the picture look, or whatever the case may be, um, you know, we've kind of built a society on like calling people out, but then more like bullying, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's not like a consistent repetition of, you know, I'm just trying to fight this one guy, this one guy, this one guy. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I think if you if you have a big enough point and a large enough audience and a platform to engage in, mm -hmm. then I think it's completely acceptable to call someone out because mm -hmm. um, how how is anyone ever going to know? I mean, it's like before the 21st century and before there was digital and all this stuff, if someone had an accident that happened to them, whether whatever it may have been, they couldn't have shared it. And then there was no, you know studies behind it that could back that up. So like an 86 list, that's something that friends and I have kind of talked about is like, what if we could create a Yelp for like chefs, mm -hmm. like where you can actually form or like what they actually taught you or whatever the case may be. Um, I mean, some chefs, they, they'll teach you a lot. Their approach is terrible, but you'll actually learn something. Mm -hmm. But there's some people that only learn something because they read between the lines and they want to learn. There's other people who, you know, just get demotivated and they wind up quitting. I mean, yeah. the, my very first job on the strip uh, at Yellowtail, when I was 19, I didn't even understand then why my fellow cook killed himself. I could not understand at that age what he was going through. But when you think about it now, it's like that guy got his shit railed more than anybody else in that kitchen. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And like, he just, he just got it fucking constantly mm -hmm. He's getting his ass railed when chef never picked on anyone else. You know what I mean? And the next thing you know, the guy kills himself. So you know, you go into something because you love it and you care about it. That's why we do it. I'm not going to work 16 hours a day because I want to work 16 hours a day. Like I'll work 16 hours a day because I love doing what I do. But then once you build that like hardship in it, when, you know, with these like ideologies and mentalities of kind of these, this older generation, mm -hmm. um, you know, you're either going to like 
destroy the industry. People aren't going to want to cook anymore. They're going to hear bad stories. They're going to hear this. And like, that's not what should happen. We should be just trying to change the culture and, uh, you know, lifting each other up to succeed because that, that's what it comes down to. It comes down to fear. Okay. It comes down to fear and the fact of if I work for someone and I'm your chef, but then I get more recognition than you get, then who's the chef, me or you? So it's all ego. It's all bullshit. And it needs to be canceled. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. if, if I worked for your restaurant and I leave and open my own restaurant, you should feel so fucking proud because you, you helped me. So there's two ways that I look at chefs in my, uh, in my career, you either helped me by actually motivating me and pushing me towards my goals and my dreams and my aspirations, or you helped me by showing me everything not to do to where I can change it on my own. So I've got to work for both of those guys. And then in return have just, you know, built my own ideologies. And even now, I mean, I have guys who help me from time to time and I tell them the same thing, like treat everyone with respect and dignity. Um, you treat others the way you want to be treated. There's, there's a time to be serious. And there's a time to play. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that, you know, kitchens can't be firm and that they don't need leadership anymore and all this stuff, because that's obviously not true, but again, it's an approach and don't be a dick. You know, there's, there's, there's time and place. Uh, you could pull me into an office or into a walk-in or out here, out here, but it's like, you want to fucking rip me open in front of my whole team. Well, that's my team, you know, yeah. like, so you just destroyed camaraderie because now you make me look like I'm a weak link or whatever the case is. So um, these, they, they don't know how to manage people. You know, you become a chef and like, you think that it's all about food and business and all this stuff. But like, what about the people underneath you that actually help you get there? Yeah, you know, exactly. what do you care about them or where do you want to see them go? So I was lucky enough to just tell one of my first chefs that gave me a chance, like how much I appreciated him and what he's done in my uh, career, basically. Mm -hmm. And all it did was make him proud because now he tells me that it's my, it's my job to pass the torch, mm -hmm. you know? So that's all it is, is it's passing the torch from generation to generation and just continuing to do what we love through food. And if mm -hmm. that in return turns into a business and a restaurant, then it's still our responsibility as a chef to express the ideologies of what we're doing. Yeah. Do you, do you foresee in the next decade, uh, decommodification of the kitchen workforce or do you, do you think that that trend of, oh, this employee is expendable. If they're making trouble for us, we'll just get a new one. Um, do you think that that's going to become a major cultural shift of, of, of kitchens working better at retaining their, their teams? Um, you know, the conversations unhad are usually the reasons why people either quit or get fired, um, because it's a fierce conversation. No one likes to have a hard conversation or like to talk about the truth or whatever. So they'd rather just write you up or fire you or the employee winds up quitting and you never know why. So there's no cultivation that's happening between owners and employees, owners and chefs, chefs and employees, anything of the sort. Um, Yeah, it seems that it's a very individual basis. It's like chef to chef, manager to manager. If they're if that's going to be their culture, then that's great. Because like Jean, when I talked with him, uh, he has a kitchen in San Francisco. He started a very famous restaurant there called Kokari in uh, in, in San Francisco. And uh, 20 years ago, same menu. He sold the restaurant, but they kept the menu, and he's like legendary there. And he said his most important job wasn't the sourcing of ingredients or the setting up of the menu, it was like building that team and building a strong team that was going to stay there for a long time. Uh, okay. So I heard, I heard that story, but then I hear the opposite of what you're saying. So it seems that it's like, it's a very one-off thing when you do go to these kitchens and see when, when it is being treated well and they're successful usually too. The thing is, is, you know, pe people, People will stay by you if you do well by them. You know, that's how a real team is made. So there are guys out there, you know, with their, their 25 year, 10 years for the same company, work for the same guy. That's amazing. I'm not trying to change that and say that you only need to work for someone for a year and then you can go be your own boss and, you know, the hell with that guy. He'll figure it out on his own because that's not, that's not it at all. It's just about giving someone the ability so for example, if I open a restaurant tomorrow and I have an executive sous chef and a sous chef and a bunch of line cooks, well, it's my job to make sure that my dishwasher one day becomes my chef. And so instead of forcing someone out, I mean, I could have always have created a new window of opportunity and said, Hey, how about we partner on a restaurant together? 
I only want to have one and you want your own, well, let's do it together. Then we can still work together mm -hmm. and grow it that way. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. No, no, it, it makes sense. Um, I, I just wanted, uh, somebody watching, uh, Joe did say, calling people out is great, it's accountability, but it can quickly become an addiction where people seek out this type of info and shame anyone and everyone that possibly can. So, yeah, I think that's a good point. I think you kind of touched on that, that you got to keep that balance of like, is this really just? And um, I mean, even with me going through my own personal experience right now of how to navigate you know how to do this it's like first you need to talk directly with that person if they it doesn't get through their thick head if the ego is just that heavy then you can elevate it to the next level and the next level and the next level i think that there there is a process to it and um is change possible i mean that's kind of the uh the goal with the accountability is that you know maybe i talked directly to him and he didn't listen to me but maybe if uh um, oh, you're, you're going to go, Daniel. That's fine. You can go. That's fine. Thank you for having me, Elise. I just have to, I have to take this phone call real fast. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I get it. Get it. Uh, thank you for coming on. Actually, if you can come back, you can try to come back afterwards because I'd love to, uh, let you plug what you're doing and give all the info about what you're doing. Perfect. Give me just one moment. To take yeah, this yeah, call. yeah. Go get it. All right. So yeah, we'll let Daniel go take his call. Let's see if I can get me here. <laughs> Too many Elises. So yeah, pretty heavy talk here with our, our new friend, Chef Daniel. Let's see, I'm gonna take some comments here. So, yeah, sometimes people go on a power trip by calling others out and it turns into bullying. That's true. Yeah, we, we're, not, we're not trying to advocate for bullying here, we're really, just trying to advocate for accountability and there's definitely a deep, a deep issue that we're, we're speaking on here. Joe says chef to chef, restaurant to restaurant, employee to employee. It's always different. That's the problem with cancel culture. There's no room for context. It's like an ideological nuke. It's true. It's true. Um, but you know, I feel like possibly there's a way that we can, we can address cancel culture where like it doesn't have to be a specific cancellation of that person and the, what he did or she did it could be like a cancellation of that culture and like let's use this example and the hurt that was created from that example as the reason for us to get behind changing that culture i think that could be a really beautiful thing but a lot of times with uh with the calling out there's there's usually emotional you know, interest behind it. Uh, somebody is feeling resentful or spiteful or whatever. Um, so I think that could be, um, could be an issue, but I think if you like, and that's why I like, I'm, I'm trying to approach with my own personal, uh, issue that I'm dealing with is, is taking it slowly step by step. Uh, of course there's emotion involved, but I think if you take it step by step, um, you can keep things in check and you can, you can keep, okay. Am I, Am I bullying at this point or is this really going to, to have an effect of um, either changing specifically their behavior? So like pointedly going to the right people that will have influence on that person to speak with them? Um, or is this going to be effective of changing that culture as a whole? Um, or is this just satisfying my own personal vengeance? Um, is uh, Yeah, it's hard to navigate that. So now I'm glad that you received the tea. Join us on Thursday for tea talk and we can drink tea together. Yeah, 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 that'd be nice. So you say yes, if you're willing to act out, then you have to be responsible for your actions and that includes others pointing it out to you. Yeah. So there's, there's like accountability within your own communities. You know, in communities uh, are groups of people with common interests, so it would make sense to uh, uh, to involve this kind of activity in a community. Um, you know, if your community has a common interest of peace and love and harmony, and there's somebody within that community that's not uh, exhibiting that and supporting that, then 
um, the community would want to uh, be involved in correcting itself and holding its members accountable for that. But it's hard when it's in a professional context. So with Daniel here, we're talking about it in a professional context. So like, this is your job, this is your boss, this is your career, this is like your dream, and uh, you're putting at a risk by standing up for yourself. Um, yeah, a big time too, not even just in your own job, not, you know, okay, yeah, I'm gonna call this guy out, he'll never hire me. But if that person is an influencer within the industry, it's very possible that you could have issues with other jobs, with other bosses, other managers. So in the professional context, it's, it is, it's is it's a, it's extra challenging, but uh, we're talking about hospitality. And if you look at statistics and hospitality, I think that things are definitely skewed in a bad way uh, of oppressing the worker. Um, actually oppressing everybody within the system too. It's not just the worker. Of course, the worker is at the end of the line, but you know, even managers and owners are also struggling with pressures and, and low margins and Yelp reviews or whatever they're struggling with. Uh, there's pressure on every end of it, but there's also very deep toxicity that's fueling all of that and uh, really does uh, need to be addressed, especially during this time when when things are going to be restructured anyway. Businesses are shutting down, new owners are going to come in, new business models are going to come in. So what a perfect time to, uh, you know, erase the drawing board, start from scratch, and start from a really strong foundation. Uh, so Senna says about cancel culture, I hate that oftentimes it doesn't leave things open for people to change, like we just cancel them but don't always give them opportunities later on. I think that happens more with celebrities or those who live a very public life. Yes, and then no. You know, like there are people that we have definitely uh, canceled in the past that are, you know, made some, you know, rebound in the, uh, in the public eye. So, um, you know, I think in time, and maybe that's time that was needed anyway for that person to heal. Um, their trauma that caused them to uh, to hurt in the first place. Um, but uh, no, you're right though. The, the, that's when it starts bordering into the bullying and into the negative impact that the, um, the accountability can can have. But um, I like Daniel's idea of, of a Yelp for chefs because what I had mentioned that 86 list is only negative. It's only calling out negative things. Like this is my personal story of being oppressed here. Um, and it's only negative stories. There's not room for positive stories, which it seems that that's what Daniel wanted to do is include those positive stories. So employees with within a company that is treating them well could have that opportunity to actually leave a positive review and say, hey, this person is actually supportive and is helping me in my, my journey and my career versus, you know, this, this company held me back and uh, discriminated against me on this and, and whatever else that could happen. There's a lot of bad things that are happening within the restaurant industry. So I'm going to look up Daniel's stuff and we can at least, we can at least see what's going on here. So he launched this uh, Chefs for Change, I believe that there's culinarylove.org. Uh, yeah, let's hope to, I think Daniel should come back. Actually, he's still logged into his, the, this, this webcasting room, so he'll come back. But yeah, Daniel is a brand new friend of mine. I literally just connected with him on Facebook through local networks yesterday. And he just started posting 
his own personal stories and his own initiatives of what he was doing. Uh, he was a uh, chef de cuisine at a very high profile local fine dining establishment, independent fine dining establishment, um, and had his, you know, had had a unjust, you know, treatment there, and um, just wanted to use that as an opportunity to to bring light to everybody else's struggles. And he's born and raised here in Vegas, which is a huge hospitality community. Uh, so it makes sense, you know, that he wants to see his peers in his city treating, you know, people within hospitality well and dignified. Hi, Kayla. Good to see you. Thanks for coming in and saying hi. Um, so Senna asks, do you encourage people adopting the views of whomever they're working for, i.e. customers, in order to get them to come back to your establishment? Yeah, I don't. I don't agree with that. I don't encourage that. And I've actually spoken on that uh, in this series before. Uh, I had actually brought up a joke. It was like a, a joke article um, about, is your bartender really in love with you or is she just doing her job? And it has like a list of all of these things of like what the bartender has done. She flirted with you or you know, she, she remembers your name or all these things that you, you typically would think, oh, this person actually has a, has a crush on me. I should, you know, when, when in actuality, they're just doing their job. They're just trying to, um, trying to make their tip or trying to sell their product. Um, and that right there, you know, I think is in alignment with what you just asked about adopting your views or um, jeopardizing your authenticity in order to accomplish your job. I think that's at the heart of all of this. And I don't think that's dignified. I really don't. I think that that's, that's a big issue. I don't like seeing that. It makes me very sad when, when I hear about that happening in the, in the restaurant industry. She says, yes, I see that very often where I'm at. It's lip service and they say whatever you want to hear, they get better tips or you can come back. It's true. So, uh, Senna, I uh, assume that you work at a restaurant. So you know all these things that we're talking about. It's hard, you know, because it's a job. And I'm sure everybody is grateful for their work and their opportunities and their ability to support their families and support themselves and live. But then at the same time, uh, there's so many points where your authenticity is challenged or your dignity is challenged, and that shouldn't be the case. It absolutely should not be the case. All right, so he gave me this link. Let's look at this. We can look at this together. He shared this. I don't know if this is his link, but we can look at it together. This looks interesting. So this website here is called Culinary Love. An industry in need. From chefs to dishwashers, the culinary industry is a well-oiled machine dedicated to providing a memorable experience to perfect strangers. In what is often a thankless job, the human component is overlooked. Needs as basic as nutrition and as complex as depression or addiction are often given low priority in a demanding industry. It's time we not only have a conversation about how to best support those who pour their heart and soul into their culinary craft, but also take the necessary action steps to promote wellness in the industry. Culinary Love is an organization dedicated to providing resources that support mental, physical, and emotional wellness for our brothers and sisters in the hospitality industry. We are a community of love and compassion for an industry that has historically lacked both. So it looks like these guys are out of Scottsdale, Arizona, so not far from here in Vegas. Let's see their about page, how often they've, how long they've been around. Of course, Anthony Bourdain, All Hill, the king of dignity in the restaurant industry. Let's see their Instagram. I often go to people's Instagrams to see how long they've been around. <laughs> Just scroll to the bottom and see. 
how long they've been posting. So first post from July 26, 2019. So they've been around for a while. So I don't think that this is his organization. Surprisingly, no, I've never worked in the restaurant industry. I'm a mixed race though, and I live in a very conservative red country. So I do experience it when we go out to eat, etc. Yeah, of course. So yeah, even if you're not a freaking employee, <laughs> you can just be a customer and you're experiencing this toxicity. Yeah. So let's see. I don't know if he has uh, his website up yet. Chefs for Change don't work. Yeah, I know he has a website. Building our voice about us. Donate. Oh, he doesn't have anything up here yet. But when he does, maybe he needs help. A WordPress website. Nothing on it. Help him out. Yeah. Let's see what else they have. Resources. What are their resources? So there's National Suicide Prevention Hotline, Crisis Text Line, Chefs with the Facebook, uh, Chefs with Issues Facebook Community. Oh, this is interesting. Chefs with Issues. For the care and feeding of the people who feed us. Depression, anxiety, addiction, eating disorders, and more. They run rampant in the food community, and they're so rarely discussed. Let's alone treat it. Let's talk about it. This is a bit of an experiment after the message boards on chefwithissues.com. Check that one out. Got spam and hacked. Great conversations were happening, but it was impossible to mod moderate. So I'm giving this a shot and trust that people are here because they want to talk openly and honestly seek help and help others. How shameful is that? You can't even have a support group on the internet without it getting freaking trolled. Jeez. Talk amongst yourselves here, restaurant folks. It's a closed group, and I'm going to try my best to only admit people from the industry. What happens here stays here. If you're a journalist sticking your nose in here, hi there. I must insist that you refrain from reporting on any conversations you see happening. The rules of the group are posted below. That's it. So, where are the rules? Four posts a day. Okay, respect everybody's privacy. Don't post food pictures. <laughs> Don't report. Don't post memes. Oh man. Be kind of what if it's like what if it's like a meme that adds value? They're cute, sure, but there are plenty of other chef groups where they can be posted and they run the risk of drowning out posts from people who really need help. Uh, don't harass other members. Don't promote. Uh, cool. So let's see their website. So, I mean, uh, over and over again, we're seeing a lot about substance abuse. They have all these resources here. about sobriety, chefs and sobriety. Yeah, it's interesting. It is very interesting. <laughs> So Senna says, it's very interesting to learn about this, particularly if both me and Daniel are in Vegas. We have a very good friend who works in the casino, so it tells it's a butler, so I'll be interested to see if he's experiencing. Yeah, you should definitely talk to your friend about his experience um, butlering. Is that bu butlering? Is that a verb? Uh, butlering on the strip. Butlers on the strip is actually a pretty... Good job. It's 
you know, from my experience, I worked with a couple of butlers with the tea program at the Lucky Dragon and it seemed pretty chill, you know, just hang out with all the high rollers and get what they want. Having good relationships, you know. And not having to, uh, you know, flirt with their clients. It's interesting how there's certain roles within the kitchen, which in the within the restaurant that are more targeted towards that that value of flirting or of mm, compromising your values for the comfort of someone else. You know, I think uh, Butlers don't get, uh, female butlers would, I'm sure. If there was a female butlers, you better guarantee they're going to be objectified. But um, butlers tend to be men. And yeah, they're not objectified. They may not be like highly respected and, and, and you know, treated as the help. But at least they're not being objectified. I don't know. If you've been a butler and you've been objectified, please share your story. I would like to be enlightened on that. <laughs> Kayla, it's good to see you. I hope you had a good weekend. Oh, yeah, Kayla, I'm sure that you could share a lot of insight talking about being a massage therapist. I would think that a female massage therapist is definitely objectified. <laughs> Can I just give you the massage? You know, I'm talking with your muscles, not with your, not with anything else. <laughs> I'm here to service you that way. Oh, Kayla, I'm sure you have a lot to say about that. And I wonder, I mean, maybe you can just comment in the text. Um, what is uh, what is the state of dignity there? You know, like, because uh, actually massage therapists that I've known having stable jobs, stable work in in the uh, the casinos were actually quite happy with their uh, their experience. But at the same time, you know, a lot of people do not recognize their victimhood. Do you know? I think that's the core of a lot of the issues that we're talking about here. Sometimes you have to like bring light to certain data for them to realize, oh wow, actually I'm I'm a victim here. I wasn't being treated well. Sometimes people don't see that right away. They're just grateful to be working. They're just grateful to have friends. They're just grateful to, you know, uh, be loved, you know, so they can be blind to what oppression or objectification may be happening to them. I know that was the case, you know, with, with what I'm personally dealing with. And um, so I get it. I get it, you know, like, and that was one thing that also got on my under my skin in the response that I got from folks. Uh, most people were supportive. Didn't victim shame, but there was a few people that victim shamed. And in addition to victim shaming, they wouldn't legitimize any of the information because the victim did not go to the authorities. No, 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 no. <laughs> That is, uh, you know, that's that's just fueling the part, the problem, and enabling, you know, more abuse. So no, that's not right either. And so that's why, when I saw Daniel post his story and post his passion about what he's working on, I said, I need to help amplify his story. Um, And you know, even if the claim is not, uh, the accusation or the claim or whatever you want to call it is not 100% accurate, it's 100% coming from an accurate origin. Um, so there's something there. Even if, even if the person that's making that accusation is coming from a position of emotion, uh, the fact that... Uh, the fact that they're responding emotionally like that is coming from someplace, you know? So 
I always uh, very much hold space for for people's stories when they come forward, even if the story is not accurate. And even if I know the story is not accurate as they're saying it, I still hold space to understand their intention and why they're even um, either believing that story to be true or why they're lying. Why, why are they motivated to, to share a false story? So Kayla says, it varies drastically from client to client. Most people in the casino, especially locals, really understood the professionality of the job. It was out-of-towners who got the worst treatment from. People who are more familiar with the hospitality industry are great. It's true. And I think that that was, that was something that I had touched on with Daniel a little bit when he was on, is that um, the clientele uh, here in Las Vegas hospitality uh, during pandemic has changed significantly. Uh, we're seeing even the food that people are ordering is is different uh so jean uh chef jean who was on this this show before he uh is good friends with hubert geller who owns fuller as well as burger bar uh and he was saying that uh, here in vegas uh he is uh now selling more chicken wings than hamburgers uh you know and so that you know kind of says something about the the clientele that is attractive to Vegas right now because the rates are really cheap right now. And Las Vegas seems to be like the main tourist attraction that's actually open. That, you know, ample hotel rooms, affordable hotel rooms, all the restaurants open for indoor dining um, is attracting a lot of people here. There's actually been a lot of shootings on the strip as well, much more than we're, we're used to. So that's scary. You know, it's literally more dangerous now. Uh, so Carla says, once I advocated for a blackjack dealer who was being sexually harassed and she told me it was no big deal and laughed it off. Yeah, that's exactly how it is. You know, like uh, even somebody like in a management position that has some incident reported to them, of course, they're supposed to follow the company protocol of reporting and and, and whatever their protocol is. But sometimes when the pressure is so high and the environment is so toxic, they won't report it. They'll instead flip it around and, you know, like victim shame, as I said. Oh, they shouldn't have been doing that. Then you shouldn't have been doing that. You shouldn't have been putting yourself in that position that invited that, uh, that hurt. So, uh, no, that's not right either. You should hold space for it. Again, even if the story is false, even if you know that there is some resentment that is motivating that false story to be told, it's coming from some place. You know, it's not coming from nowhere. So trying to understand, you know, yeah, there, there's a lot of work that can be done there. But again, it's work. So, you know, people, people are afraid to do more work than, than what they have to. And so then that's that oppressive system itself. If you're operating a business where all of your staff, including HR, including managers, are all empowered, proud to do their work, and going to go above and beyond, then, yeah, they'll, they'll do the job right. They'll follow the protocol they need to follow without allowing these kinds of problems to get in the way. But instead, no one likes to fill out a sexual harassment report. They're not fun to fill out. Hi, I'm Asami. Good to see you. Ohio. Ohio gozaimasu. I believe you're in Japan. I believe you are. We're talking about the dignity of chefs today. And uh, we had a guest chef, uh, Daniel. He'll be coming back very soon. Uh, but uh, he... Uh, he was giving us some insight into the Las Vegas hospitality industry, the toxic nature of it, and his vision and initiatives to change that culture. Put more women in charge. And, like, uh, unjaded women. Because <laughs> like, there's a big difference, you know? 
women that have been hardened by the patriarch and most the new term we're using now aged most aged women in positions of success and positions of leadership got to those positions because they got hardened so that's understandable i totally commend and congratulate women that have done that i've done it myself you know up until just a few years ago um more unshaded women <laughs> exactly i was I, I wouldn't have called myself jaded but i was hardened i was hardened to see that my ability to not judge the patriarch uh, which i didn't you know i accepted it too my tech friends, they wanted to go to a strip club. I knew that I had an advantage if I went to that strip club and didn't judge and just sit back and let the boys have their fun and give them half eyes afterwards. Oh, I win big time because I'm cool with the bros. And so, you know, when opportunity comes along, you know, I'm always the first one called. And I took that as an advantage. Uh, I, I didn't penalize other women for not being hardened, which a lot of a lot of women in positions of leadership do do that. They do tell you, "Oh, well, you've got to, you got to do what you got to do to get there." You, you know, and that's wrong too. Because uh, I experienced that uh, when I became a feminist. I experienced that. I tried to reach out to female leaders, uh, you know, even personal mentors of mine, uh, and they they say, "Why, why, you know." I once had somebody tell me I was complaining about I went to a fundraising event to pitch TLET and you know try to meet some potential new investors and um, I was uh, objectified big time I was the only woman there I nailed the pitch I like showed up everybody I gave the best pitch uh, but I was the only woman there and uh, inevitably was objectified and I definitely felt that uh, because I did not welcome somebody's advances, uh, that I did not receive the opportunity that he had initially offered to me. And I'm fine with that. That's whatever. It's his loss. I see it as a filter. You know, like, I don't want to be working with a douche bag like that anyway. So, like, that event happening actually saved me from wasting time and energy on him. Uh, but it's still shitty that it happened. And it does. It, it, it's shitty that it happens all the time, and not just to me, but to all women uh, in some shape or form. And so I was like speaking to a mentor about it, and their response to me was like, you should just quit. I mean, if you really if you really want to succeed in that, you just, just sleep with them already. And I'm like, really? That's, that's the response? That's the wise response that I get in that? I don't accept it. Um, so yeah, there is better. I mean, we have to build the, the, the culture to support it. And women will do it, but it's got to be the ones that are not hardened. Because, yeah, we put women in charge. And that's what ends up happening. You know, these, like, executive boards are like, oh, we need to, you know, we need to fix the, uh, the gender balance. You know, check the resumes of all the women that are qualified for these positions. And, again, more than likely they're hardened. And you know, like, uh, don't see sexism as a problem because it was never a problem for them specifically because they built these protective cases to be within. Um, and then they end up putting down other women. Uh, and so putting those women in charge is not the forward thinking. It's almost going to have to be young women uh, that may not have experience in positions of leadership because I don't think there's a lot of of women with uh, with leadership or in, in official positions of leadership uh, that have not been hardened. And it's just reality and it's not their fault. I give them space to change. Now if they're not going to change and they're going to continue to like victim shame and say what's well, your fault that you're not successful because you didn't know how to dress sexy enough to get the attention or you didn't know how to do this or you didn't take advantage of this then that's like no, no good. Uh, so Joe says, we have a slight issue with those jaded women here in town. There's a big movement to exclude men, not just here, but all over, even to the point where the local women in business are throwing events and allowing men to come, but charging us more to attend. It's super toxic. <laughs> That's funny. 
I don't know. I mean, maybe it's effective. There's a guy, there's a chef from uh, Lagos, uh, Nigeria, which I've actually... Lagos, I'm sorry. I, mispronounce, I always pronounce, mispronounce that word. I'm like, it's Lagos, but no, it's Lagos. Um, and uh, he is... Uh, he is famous. He's well known. He's black, of course, coming from Nigeria and really like worked his way up um, once he uh, immigrated to the U.S. And he became famous for building these restaurant pop ups. Uh, specifically, I think the one that he did was in Nashville. So Nashville has the spicy chicken. That's what they're famous for there. So he made a pop up restaurant to sell this spicy chicken and he charged different prices to white people or black people. Uh, and of course, the white people had to pay more. Um, and it was very controversial, but it was kind of also just like a one-off demonstration just to kind of make people get some feelings um, and, and, and understand. Uh, I, yeah, he's not doing it at scale. You know, he doesn't have like a chain of restaurants that are behaving that way. I think it was just like a, it was like a one-off experience to get some press and to get people talking about oh, is that wrong or is that right? Uh, what kind of statement is being made there? But yeah, it's it, at, at a mass scale, it is not, uh, it is not effective. Integrity all around and unhardened. That's hard. Yep. That is hard. I can't believe I'm not jaded. I'm like, I've been through some shit, man. I just keep going and the haters just keep, you know, but survive. We all survive. And uh, it's a lot more fun to love than to hate. So that's what like I keep my mind focused on. Even though it's hard. It's hard to, to navigate that. And sometimes you feel very emotional and you just want to fuck shit up. Um, but that's not going to serve either. <laughs> Joe says, spite is truly hindering women from their full potential. I get it, but it's simply unhealthy and unproductive. Spite against men. What's really bad is spite against women. And that's uh, that's something that I take a particular... You know, if someone wants to men-hate, I'll tell them, no, this is not about man-hating. So real-world example of this counter counteracting and not being effective is um, I have experience with a female-owned business uh, and female owned, female run, and very proud, 100% female everything, which is great. But then you, there were some issues, you know. So like you had the feminine energy, uh, which is very, uh, is very emotional. First of all, nothing wrong with emotions. I'm woman. I'm emotional. I cry. I get angry. I do shit like that. It's great. Uh, but you know, it's good to have that countering. Um, the countering energy of pragmatism, strength, fast ego, uh, to counter that, you know, long-term vision, emotional, uh, proud, um, those things need to be working together. And so, you know, you had this company that was more weighed way towards this side um, and ended up, you know, causing some conflicts and misunderstandings. And I was like, yeah, so that's it. You know, like the, the balance is really important from both sides. We both need each other. You know, if it's all men, we all know what happens when it's all men running everything. Like they run into the ground and don't give a shit about 10 years from now. Um, but then, you know, when it's all women, they're so hung on and attached to their vision of where 10 years is that like, there's a lot of emotional decisions that get made in the interim that, you know, if you don't have those countering balances uh, of energies, then, you know, you, you can be just as toxic as a, a, a full male run organization. Oh man, the camera keeps going out. So that's it on the strip. It's common to charge a higher, a higher cover for men than women at clubs. Yes. That's true, Kayla, but that's business. Also messed up, but that's business. That, uh, so the reason why that happens is uh, that's the business model. So you need the women there to motivate the men 
to buy them drinks. Um, and, you know, to, to, to motivate men to want to come to the club. Like, oh, there's going to be a lot of women there we can meet. And then on the business side, yeah, the, 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 the men end up, um, you know, buying more drinks. And it works out in business. So, yeah, they'll, they'll, like, charge women. Like, sometimes it's free. Women for free or women for 10 bucks, And then they charge $50 for men. Because they, they want more women there so that there's more drinks made. Which is all related to the, the same problem in hospitality, the sexism. That, like, there's a business model around the objectification of women. That, like, a, a social interaction with a woman is purely uh, the potential opportunity for a sexual encounter fueled and lubricated with alcohol versus the business model that like we're creating a high value social interaction which may or may not lead to an opportunity for sexual encounters maybe it will maybe it won't it doesn't matter that's not what matters what matters is the social experience that we're creating for you uh, so there's something else also very toxic you know, which then, you know, if you're trying to create a sexual culture and kind of this idea of the potential of a sexual encounter, your entire culture and experience has to also be integrated with that. So um, your servers must be very sexualized. Yeah. I think Daniel might come back, Jeff. I don't know. He's still logged in, so maybe he'll come back. Countering, Mark says countering balances are the shit. Yep. Balance is, is important. It's super important. You can't have it one way or the other. It's toxic in any case. Uh, either way. But balance is good. Yeah, I uh, want Daniel to come back. Because, you know, I looked up his website... And uh, it's not active. He doesn't have anything up there yet. So I want him to come back so he can tell us directly what his intentions are and what he's got going on. Joe says, the most successful and well-loved businesses around here are run by a couple, a balanced man and woman team. There you go. Local, small, balanced. Everybody loves them. You need those countering energies. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I don't I don't buy the whole female run and operated. Although technically my business is female run and operated 100%, but it's just me. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> it's a lot more fun to love the date. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, sometimes it's so easy to to hate, though. I caught myself, and I talked about it. I talked about it with Jay Davis the other day, and he was like, you don't hate. You've never had a hateful, a hateful thing happen. Oh, man. COVID cases up in Clark County, and they said all of the hospitality industry is like the main source of our growth in numbers, our casinos and restaurants. But it's okay. So I am going to uh, now share Daniel's post that I first saw. This was from the 25th, so this is three days ago, so Friday. He posted it to, to Facebook. Let's see. Open. Uh, he called him out too, straight up. Straight up. It's a lot more fun to love the date. Let's see. 
He says, don't you ever send me a message telling me to erase something of which I dedicated my blood, sweat, and tears for from third degree burns and never leaving my shift to enduring a restaurant ran smoothly while the owner was in the hospital getting drunk or on vacation to only in return have my contract cut one and a half years early. I will not stand for any anyone, business owner, chef to ever disrespect me or anyone else. I will make it my goal and mission in life to end the mental abuse in the restaurant industry and that starts today. I stand for everyone who has ever been fired for no reason, for everyone who has felt suicidal because of a boss they had. I stand for everyone who has had it in had to live in fear during their employment. Today I stand up for myself. Great. So that's that's why I got connected to Daniel. And now he is building this website which you know, it has nothing on it, but hopefully, well, soon. Chefs for Change. There we go. There's the website right there. Chefsforchange.org. It has nothing in it. Building our voice. But it seems as if, based off of what he had said before, I see there's even a shop here. Uh, nothing here in the shop. He had said he wanted to build something like the Yelp for chefs, which is great. I mean, we have we have what glass glass door glass door. Right? That's the one. It's like the the website for um, employers <laughs> to review your employers. Yeah, that's what they do. But this is different, you know, this is specifically for the hospitality industry. So, different. I hope you got a good call. Maybe he's he's on with some journalists. He told me that he's been getting a lot of uh, messages from people. So this post got 105 likes, 90 comments, 77 shares. And then he's been posting all of his conversations with other people, other chefs reaching out to him and saying, hey, thanks for doing this. This needs to be done. Yeah, I won't say who the chef is. If you want to, I'm sure you can go find Daniel on, on Facebook and, and see who he's talking about and what restaurant he's talking about. But yeah, I'm not trying to create a cancel culture here. <laughs> We're trying to cancel the culture itself, not not some people within it, not some bad players within it. Because people have, uh, what kind of mic do you use? I just use the mic on my computer. I have mics and I keep wanting, I have like a boom mic and then I have some lapel mics. And I keep meaning to install them and start using them, but I don't know, it always gets off, but... I do not use a lapel mic. I just use the mic on my computer. It's pretty good, you know? It's like it's good enough that I'm okay with it, although it does give it a little bit of an echoey feel. But, like, I don't know. I watch live streams and people that have, like, a, a proper mic. Like, yes, you can hear them clearly and only them. Like, it's not picking up other noise. But then it also feels like you're hearing them within, like, a, a, a vacuum or something. Um, although, you know, this mic, I know it makes it feel like it's like a <laughs> echo chamber or something a little bit. Your condenser mic doesn't pick up as well if you're right next to it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to hook up the boom mic. I'll make a stand like on the ceiling and I'll just like connect it up. So at least then it doesn't sound echoey. But my tea room is pretty well insulated and silent, so I don't have to worry about background noises. 
unless of course Bitcoin's in here and wants to bark, um, then there will be some background noise. But Daniel, Daniel, what's going on? Shout out to Las Vegas Matcha. There's lots here in Vegas. So we got uh, Makers and Finders, Take It Easy, Golden Fog. That's opening up soon in the Arts District. But today I went to go visit Mothership Coffee Roasters' new location at uh, St. Rose in Henderson. Beautiful location. Wow, so beautiful uh, and good matcha. And actually matcha growing in popularity. So uh, they've been ordering uh, like crazy lately, completely caught off guard. Uh, they weren't keeping track of their inventory and ended up uh, <laughs> uh, running out, which is good. It's a good problem to have, you know. Uh, and But I was talking with the baristas and they said that about one in five orders now is a matcha. This is at a... Uh, probably our most well-established coffee roaster in town, known for its coffee. Uh, but now one in five drink order is a matcha drink, so it's good. Good news. More dignity in the hospitality industry. <laughs> uh, more good matcha. So yeah, if you're in Vegas or ever visit Vegas and looking for some good coffee, I do recommend Mothership Coffee. They have three locations here in town now, one in Green Valley, one at, uh, at Ferguson's, uh, downtown Ferguson, uh, which is a really cool destination for food and drink now uh, in, in, on Fremont in, in downtown Las Vegas. Uh, and they're a brand new, beautiful location, which is great for like meetings and sitting down. Um, so if you're looking for a good place to meet around the Eastern St. Rose area, I do recommend their spot. Brand new building. I didn't even know it was there. It just popped up out of nowhere. I was like, wow. But uh, yeah, that was nice. Always good to see uh, more matcha in town and people doing different things with matcha. So take it easy in Chinatown. Yeah, Mothership, Kayla. They are rad. Yeah. So that's also Sunrise Coffee. Sunrise Coffee on Sunset and Eastern uh, near Sun uh, Sunset Park. Uh, actually, Sunrise Coffee was the first independent coffee shop here in Vegas. I forget how many years ago, 12 or 13 years ago, Guani uh, Romero started that one. So kind of a landmark here in Vegas. We didn't have a coffee culture. You know, Sunrise was pretty much it. They weren't roasting their own beans. They, they were getting their beans from a different roaster. Uh, but then they launched their own roasting operation, and now they have several locations here in town. It's wonderful. But now there's other coffee roasters as well, which is also wonderful. So we have, uh, yeah, lots of roasters. It's amazing how many have popped up just since I moved here seven years ago. When I moved here, there was one coffee roaster in, uh, in Boulder City, I believe. I do know Desert Wind. Um, they do not have our matcha. I would like to. So if you're friends with them, if you'd like to recommend how they can get their hands on the good matcha, you can say, hey, just call Tea Lip. They're just down the street. Yeah, I'd love to help them with their tea. But uh, also Aware Coffee up in Centennial Hills. So if you're all the way up there, you're looking for something good, uh, you can visit with them. And I believe that they just completed a brand new mural. So if you're into art, it looked nice. The mural looked very nice. So if you're into art, then uh, definitely uh, go check them out. Aware Coffee. And they also make the matcha drinks, lattes, or whatever else. And then uh, Take It Easy. Um, Cool, Kayla. Thanks. Yeah. You can tell them. You can tell them if they've tried the matcha at these other places. You can say, hey, it's a local vendor. They can get it from. Actually, uh, Sin City Coffee, who's a coffee distributor here in town, um, they distribute our matcha. So they can also get it from them as well. Same price. Just more convenience because they... Uh, that that coffee distributor is regularly doing deliveries around town. I don't like I can, but I don't regularly do it. So, uh, you know, if a coffee shop like wants to be able to order any day and just get it that same day, uh, best for them to work with that coffee distributor than to work with me because uh, uh, it's just me. If I need a live stream all day, I need a live stream all day, and I can't be doing deliveries. So. <laughs> 
Yeah, Take It Easy in Chinatown, which is a sister location of um, Makers and Finders. They just opened in downtown uh, in Chinatown, uh, right behind like where the Golden Tiki and the fucking Long is, um, and the streets behind there, and the alleys behind there, which actually Tila used to be there. We used to be right next to them, but then I moved here. Uh, but they do, uh, it's like a Colombian bakery coffee shop, uh, and they're making all kinds of great Colombian, like cheese breads and different empanadas, uh, as well as awesome coffee drinks, as well as like, like mocktails. So they're not just like a uh, normal, like latte based drinks, coffee drinks, espresso based coffee drinks, but they're making like really innovative, very innovative. Even with the matcha, they're doing like, a. The Delgona uh, with uh, chocolate, you know, cacao nibs and other stuff. It's really good. I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a unique experience. And, uh, yeah, I think they need more support because it's kind of hidden back there. And they just opened a few weeks ago, so not everybody knows about them. But they have really great product, really great coffee in Chinatown, which we were missing. We only had one coffee shop in Chinatown for the longest time, and it was bad. Let me tell you how bad it was. It was so bad. I took, I had taken Jean with me. We finished the lunch. Uh, Jean Alberti, the um, iconic French chef. Uh, so he has a particular standard he likes to keep on the food and, and beverage that he enjoys. And he, uh, we went to go get an espresso after our lunch, and <laughs> like literally just spit out. It was that bad. And uh, his assessment was that they weren't uh, cleaning the espresso machine in between their espresso shots. And he said they probably haven't cleaned it in years. That's how bad it tastes. <laughs> well, I don't know, Daniel. What He, he must have got an important call, which is good. You know, I hope it's a good call for him. He's still open on his Zoom. So as soon as he gets back to his computer, it's going to be the first thing he's going to see. So I can't imagine, you know, he's completely ditched us. He's just on his call. I'll give him a couple more minutes before I completely give up. I hope everybody had a good weekend. I did. I went, uh, I went to California and uh, had a really great time. I spend some time in the ocean, a lot of time in the sun, as you can see, my skin already starting to peel. I'm in these dark spots here. They're about to peel off. I just know it. So you may see an evolution in my face throughout the week as <laughs> layers of skin come off, but uh, I wouldn't exchange it for anything. I love the ocean so much. And I realize it's like only a five hour drive from here. I always like roll it out. Like I live in the desert. I'm a desert one now. I've just got to embrace the desert. It's like, no, I don't. I could just drive four hours and be in the ocean. So I'm going to do it more often. I may even buy a surfboard because I was, you know, body surfing and sunbathing and just wondering, damn, I wish I had a surfboard. I'd have so much, so much fun out there. You harvested and pressed pears and apples. That sounds great. Where did you harvest? You harvested pears and apples here in Las Vegas, Kayla? Or are you back in Oregon? I have harvested apples here in Las Vegas. My friend had an apple tree and, and I took some down and tried to make some juice and stuff from it, but boy, oh boy, were those things dry. <laughs> they were so dry, they were totally ripe. They were totally ripe and ready to go. You take a bite out of this apple and it was like, like, like slurped up any type of liquid you could have had in your mouth. It was so drying. Like, this is not good. And then I tried to make, like, an apple pie or something, and I tried to, like, rehydrate it and add some more juiciness to it, but the astringency was just too much. Oh, you're back in Oregon. That makes sense. <laughs> That's good. Pears and apples. I love pears. You did that all weekend long. You must have uh, pressed a lot of juice. Are you preserving it? Are you freezing it, or did you did you add some preservative to it? Oh, he's making hard cider with it. Wow, lucky you. It should be delicious. Um, yeah, making alcohol from fruit juice is so easy. It's so easy. 
you just have to have like the right environment, you know, clean environment so that you're, you know, cultivating the right, uh, <laughs> the right yeast in there. So you don't spoil it, but it's pretty easy. When I was in the Peace Corps in Africa, we used to make mango wine all the time. You know, you just juice the mangoes and uh, just leave it to ferment. So you don't even have to do much. Just make sure it's all clean. And uh, yeah, you can get pretty lit. But I'd imagine hard cider is a, you know, you gotta control things a bit more and you wanna make sure you get the right carbonation. So it's a little. Hydraulic press is really cool. I've never seen one. It was like, uh, yeah, hydraulic presses are cool. I was talking about hydraulic presses the other day in the oolong tea, Taiwanese oolong tea production. They use hydraulic presses on the tea leaves to create the balls. Let's see what I got in here. I don't, I don't have any balls here. No balls. Maybe over there? No balls here. No, that's not balls either. I don't have any balls to show you here immediately, but there are some teas that come, you know, the whole leaf set is like squished into, you know, the ball. And after you infuse it, the hot water opens and you can see the leaves, you know, but it's in a ball when it's dry. It's like, how do they get it in that ball? It's so tight. But that's from a hydraulic press. Actually, in the old school ways, they used to use their knee you know, but then they started uh, moving to the uh, the hydraulic press. I'll show you. Actually, I've got a video handy right here. I'll show you. Oh, I've got my paper here. Zero three three eight. Here we go. Playing the video. Oh, no, there shouldn't be. It's having a problem playing the video. No, not possible. I just played this video the other day for my class. My, uh, where do you Video 38. Oh, now it doesn't even want to show me. View details. Yeah, you brought up hydraulic press, so now I've got to, I just have to. Interesting. Wow. Sometimes. Amazing. How technology doesn't want to work for you sometimes. All right, so yeah, Kayla, I'm sorry. I might not be able to show you the traditional way, but I can definitely show you the other way, the hydraulic press. Oh no, this one's not going to want to go either. It's telling me I have to download all these files. No, I don't need to download them. Open. Connect more apps. I'm sorry, guys. A tarot reading app? No, that's not going to help me at all.
Open a new window. Maybe if I do that, it'll work. Okay, here we go. There it is. See? Let's see if we can get some audio on it. So there's a bag of tea right there. And it's getting pressed on all four sides. All four walls of the cabin are getting pressed. And then they'll open it. Let me replay it. They'll open it. So that's the, the big bags. They'll open it and then uh, put that, see there's the hydraulic right there. You see how it's all compressed, it's super flat, like these tight cubes all flat compressed. And then they'll throw this tea into a tumbler to like loosen up the leaves and then throw it back in the hydraulic press and they'll do that cycle 21 times. And after 21 times of getting uh, pressed in the hydraulics and then opened up. So you can just put it inside that, that uh, it, it compresses into little balls, and that's how you get ball doolong. So, yeah, it's cool. Hey, actually, now my, my thing is working, so I should be able to show you that other video. It was 38, video 38. So traditionally, they used to have to just do it with their own body force. He wants to show us, like, uh, before the people, they don't have machine. They use the hand and loading. Yeah, before, they have no, no machine. Yeah, good job. Ah. Uh, uh, how long, how long would this process take hand rolling like that? Like, how long would this process Hard work. Doing that by hand. 30 times. Hard work. So after that step finished, then they just put inside here, and they need a whole time. That was enough work. He, he did enough work. That was it. <laughs> That's funny. I love his facial expression there. He's like, yep, it's done. I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, that's the dryer. That's the dryer back there. The lady's putting the tea into the dryer to, to do its final drying. Because the balls, they've already been shaped. All right, I'm starting to lose hope that Daniel's going to come back. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to have him come next week <laughs> and finish uh, finish stating with us his intention and his manifesto. Um, but it was good. I was able to like get the conversation going with him, introduce him to you guys. And hopefully uh, by next week, he'll have a lot more insight and um, progress on his website as well. Um, so that we can talk about possible ways that even you can get involved and, and help advocate uh, for this issue of uh, empowerment and, and dignity in the, uh, the teams of the kitchens that we love because, dang it, we need to eat. We're never going to stop needing to eat. Um, so we need to support the ones that are feeding us first and foremost. But... Uh, 
I love you guys all very much. Thank you so much for tuning in today and to supporting. And um, yeah, I'll see you next time. Much love. Have a great week.